I lead with my heart. So I want people to feel our mission, to feel self more than I want them to hear us. Um, I'm the director of culture equity and leadership team, and we just been really working on a lot of different things, um, especially with the launch of the strategic roadmap. Um, there's a lot of areas where my team are um, is directly implicated, and the things that we're working on are things like really changing the adult experience, student experience, and system experience. So that can be anything from reaffirming shared core values is something that I'm working on. Um, we also have like amplifying student voice, which is the student experience um, and kind of rethinking how schooling is and how we want it to be and how we want um, our, our students, our students of color to experience schooling. Um, so that's another program that we have is the AEA is um, Achieving Excellence Academy. So that was launched um, the summer of last year. And so we're working on a lot of different things. So I think I have my team, my team and I have like seven big lifts. And do you mind maybe just sharing one of those? Yes. So two pop in my head right away is uh, reaffirming our shared core values. And I can't remember this verbatim, but it's like building an asset base minded um, educator. Those are the two things that kind of are always running in my head because I think those are two lifts that can change the scope and sequence of like how we vibrate in BPS. And I, I think like it's, if we're intentional and we deliver and we do all these things, like we'll be the, not, the bottle's not big enough. We'll be the change that education needs to see. Obviously, This is a very, very important job for you. Mm -hmm. This is a very important duty. Um, you leading a whole team with such important work to do, I assume that it touches your identity, your story, who you are. I wonder if you um, can share with us a little bit about your story, where you're coming from, and, and maybe you can help us connect a little bit of who you are, your identities, mm -hmm. with the job that you're trying to lead for in DPS. Absolutely. My story doesn't start with me. It starts with my grandparents. My granddad came from Oklahoma and was in some riots and left with the clothes that was on his back and moved to Chicago. And with the, within a year, he was a homeowner. My grandma was a CNA, certified nurse assistant. She graduated. She was one of the first graduating classes of Malcolm X University. So I mentioned those two, those two people because... They're, they're my story. My my grandpa had this strength, this uncanny strength and resolve to move forward regardless. Um, and I just think about what it took to come to a place with just the clothes on your back and then build a foundation and then build a history of what he things could be in for me <laughs> to be here today. And my grandma is just this piece of love not peace but she 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 is everything to me she she's love um and she aligns with my purpose which is to help people how I lead um I, I love more than I fight <laughs> because that's because that's what we need to do to change and so I like I mentioned before I've been in DPS for 23 years I started off as a paraprofessional in the a effective needs center And I just, not just, I, I needed a job to take care of my kids, uh, my kid, my first kid, because my experience with my father wasn't a happily ever after kind of story. And I wanted to break that cycle with my child. So giving up some dreams and other things, I had to be more responsible. And so I got a job as a paraprofessional, supporting students that have emotional disabilities, I didn't know much about that, but once again, going back to my grandma, like I knew, I know what love is, and I know what caring is, and I know what valuing is, and so that's what I did, and through my paraprofessional career, which was five, five years, people kept saying, like, how do you do that, and I was like, I don't think I'm really doing anything, I'm just valuing a person, valuing humanity, valuing 
a being valuing somebody's child. Um, then I went to be a special education um, tech technician with the district, and I did that for five years where I traveled. Um, I worked in the middle school network, so I supported middle schools, uh, especially around behavior and special education. Um, then I became a special education associate partner, which is, they call them SEISs now, special education instructional specialists. I did that for three or four years. Then I did A&I, which is effective needs intensive. And these are students that have the most severe behavior in the district. And we did, I did that for a year and was really successful. Then I became the manager of behavior strategies. I did that for three years, um, four years, and now I'm the director of CEL. And I think, especially around special education, being a specialist and being a special education tech, I, I got to see inequities. It, it was blaring via people of color or via because of a disability. And that, that never sat right with me. So I didn't always have the right terms and the right words to call it out. And didn't necessarily have the quote unquote authority to make change happen. Um, I didn't get my degree until I was 35. So my journey was a bit different. Um, so once I got my degree, I, I, I kind of, I'm rising through the ranks, so to speak, at a, at a nice pace, but more importantly, I, I was able to have more influence. And so being the manager of behavior strategy, I know how behavior gets this bad rap of how are you going to control students? And you don't control students. You don't control <laughs> uh, kids. Like, you, you can't. And I also know what that looks like because that also conforms to the dominant narrative of black, brown students having all these behaviors. So when I was the manager of behavior strategies, I was intentional of what that looked like because I – what I was symbolizing, and also my approach. So it's really about coach modeling and training, working with adults um, to help understand their experience and what they're going through and building this authentic relationship with adults to model how they could build authentic relationships with children. I, I told you earlier, I lead with my heart. So I want people to feel our mission, to feel self more than I want them to hear us. Because once you have this relationship and a bond, it changes you. So that's how we're trying to lead and cultivate relationships and have the <clears throat> sense of belonging. Um, and then that's when the work can go forward. I love how you build up all of your professional expertise and wisdom that you have built upon the foundation of the love of your grandma. That is so powerful. Dope. Your your connections with your story and how you quickly go to your job is like boom, boom, <laughs> boom, boom. Like because of this, I believe in that. Because of this, I believe in that. And it seems so authentic. Like you don't even hesitate in making those connections. It sounds like you've thought a lot about that. And it also sounds that you, so you became a father yourself. Yes. And one of the things that, you're focusing on is just breaking that cycle of not having somebody at home present to help you be a man, be a boy, be somebody that's contributor to the community. And now you have the opportunity to be a dad. Uh, how is it going for you? I, I'm a dad as well. And I was blessed with two boys as well. So I am very intentional in the way I am teaching them how to be boys and how to become men. So I'm curious to see how it is going for you. How old are yours? Um, I have three children. 2018 and 14 okay. um two boys are the oldest and parenting is difficult to be quite honest i love it every day but it it, it also hurts every day to be quite honest not necessarily having a consistent dad in my life like what is a man what is a man supposed to be how is a man supposed to move how is a man supposed to vibrate so not knowing that i I'm I'm still a father that's growing and learning, and I always haven't did things perfect. Um, but I was really intentional with showing up <laughs> yeah. and being there. So even if, when I'm getting it wrong or I make a mistake, like I want to be there. I want to ask questions. I want to learn and grow. And it's not about being tough. It's about being whole. Um, 
and whole, Ooh, I love that uh, whole meaning showing love. So like initially, it's all I, men don't cry, <laughs> men aren't sensitive, um, men are tough, and just growing and leaning more into like my grandma is like what our young men need more is to be loved and to get in and get in touch with being sensitive, sensitive and vulnerable. Right. Because that to me, that's true strength to say that I'm hurting and I need this, this and this versus acting like it's not there and I go around being an empty vessel are two totally different things. Like to me, that's being, that's, that's being more weak than it is being strong. So I, what I'm trying to invest and in, teach my kids more than anything is like one mental health and, and two, like how are you loving and valuing yourself and listening to your body and listening to your heart and listening to your mind to put back some of the things that society has taken out. Heck, even your parents have taken out or uh, the educational system or whatever has t- taken out. Like how are you investing in yourself and like investment meaning loving yourself and appreciating the things that you might not like the shadow selves and some of your behaviors and all these other things are just moments of opportunities to grow and that is super important not only for for us as fathers and our boys and our kids watching us be their parents that is a trend that i noticed in in our society currently that we little we foster little discussions around healthy manhood and what it is like to be a man that makes you proud, that makes you whole. I love that. It's not about being tough. It's about being whole. And how can we translate and model those behaviors to our boys, to our kids, to our young adults? It appears that the main conversation happens around all the elements that, men ma- that make masculinity toxic. Mm-hmm. The toxic masculinity is what floods my Facebook and Instagram and social media news, all the elements that make men oppressive, awful, evil, bad. Uh, And I am always wondering about what can we do to also talk about the things that make men good, that make men necessary, um, as it relates to the increasing crisis that we see in our high schools and all of our boys and all the behavior issues that you might be very well aware who are the ones that get in trouble the most in our schools. So I love every time I, every time I sit with a father, I always love to bring that conversation about what it is like to be a man and redefine that or contribute to a healthy, positive approach to what the healthy idea of manhood is and how that impacts the community. Uh, when a man is not at its best, everybody around him hurts. And we know that with our moms. We know that with our single moms and with our perfectly competent professional worker females who might be in the search for a partner if, if they are interested in having a man as a partner. Um, and how, unfortunately, I don't know if you agree or not, but unfortunately I see that gap getting bigger and bigger, the, the lack of celebrating those positive attributes of manhood and and how can we integrate those so we can have a more diverse and rich uh, environment? W- what do you think about that? I, I think we're at a bit of a crossroads, to be quite honest. Of There's a dominant culture of toxic masculinity, right? And so it's like, all right, you can't be strong at all. And it's just like, it's, it's either either or, but it's like there's opportunities and there's times where we need men to be strong, Uh, like unwillingly strong, but there's also times that we need man to be sensitive, unwillingly sensitive and just knowing when to play these different, different parts. And like, I think there's, there's different points of society is like dismissing is either you're too sensitive or too strong, not both. And that makes man quote unquote, super linear. And it makes us less complex and we're, pretty complex being we're emotional beings we're sensitive beings and that's been taken out of manhood so like what I'm trying to to support with and even lead with is like I'm sensitive I'm super sensitive and that's not a weakness my sensitivity allows me to value and support my team better 
it allows me to build deeper and more authentic relationships because I listen and learn and value you. So when a team member on my team hurts, I hurt too. So we can't move forward until we're whole. Now, I'm not saying I'm a healer or anything like that, but I like my sensitivity allows me to be intentional with the environments I create so people can heal or so people can be whole um, at home and uh, at work. And to be quite honest, it's probably harder, harder at home, right? Because there's this investment that you have in your kids that's unwilling, unwielding. And so like how, how we're creating or how I'm creating that environment to take away the toxic masculinity, but allow masculinity to still exist is difficult. But at the, at, at the same time, I'm trying to take away labels, I, I'm trying to just to say, son, <clears throat> daughter, B. I don't care what it is or what it has been gender in the past. You get to be whoever you want to be and do whatever you want to do, as long as it's not intentionally hurting others. Yes. So I think w- I think we are this generation of of uh, raising leaders that are bringing that new perspective, and, right. and and I think it's necessary now that you are in DPS and you're the director of the equity work. And me also as a school principal, I'm always thinking, what are those attributes? If we had, it's a really hard question as well. Uh, so please don't feel that I'm expecting you to tell me something with perfection. But <laughs> I, if you can help me uh, by sharing your ideas of, uh, of a great leader, maybe we can build that collective wisdom uh, together. Yeah, I think I'm, I mentioned <clears throat> some of these words before. I think some of the attributes of a great leader is being vulnerable people center, humanity center, empathetic. I also think a great leader has to have high emotional intelligence. Yeah. Another aspect or attribute is it's reflective. To me, it's not about getting things right. It's about learning from your mistakes. And I want to be, I, I, I like to be a leader that makes a whole bunch of mistakes. <clears throat> I don't make the same mistake twice because if we're doing everything that we've always done, we're going to get what we always get. So I'm a visionary and innovator kind of leader that puts our, puts myself out there. And sometimes I fall flat on my face, but that's okay. I like, to me, that's what a a leader does. That's the modeling piece. I'm modeling vulnerability. I'm modeling risk taking. I'm modeling all the things, a lot of things that we want to say, seeing our kids like right we say bloom's taxonomy getting to self actualization uh-huh. but we create environments where they're just performing by giving you definitions that's that's uh-huh. not that's not that's not learning and i think leadership is the same way i want to get to the place of self actualization where my my people know who they are and that's accepted so like i think a leader also cr- is able to create spaces and in environments of being your authentic self and belonging. I also think a leader values and validates consistently and has these authentic and layered relationship, not surface relationship, like really layered relationships where it's not a token nicety. Like if somebody walks by me, I know if they're doing well or not. <laughs> yeah. And if they're not, we're going to stop and dive deep <clears throat> into that so, so, so they can be well or I do know what's going on so I can be more intentional on how I support so it might be that person needing to step away and stay at home I I I think leadership is creating a family Uh. Um, because like doing equity work it's not a job for me it's 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 purpose like this is air like if I wasn't doing this I don't want to do anything else because I know I'm changing lives like so I I feel the responsibility of 80 88,000 students, 15,000 adults. Like, I take that seriously. So how I lead, I'm trying to lead by example of, like, like once again, ba- valuing and building relationships. So anybody that looks at Michael Sykes, like, knows, like, like he loves his team. He loves his people. He loves ed- education, but also being vulnerable and honest and speaking my truth of, like, when I see inequity, like, you get to fire too. Um, to like burn the inequity and also to warm the people that need to be healed. And 
and, and so, like, I think there's this part of leadership where we have to be authentically honest, not just to call people out or call people in, but to say and speak our experience and our truths and how we're feeling in that moment. Because I, I, to me, I think we sometimes as leader, we let too much s- stuff go by and don't bring it to light. And so those are the things that we need to address as leaders. So I think a attribute of leaders is like calling, having those honest conversations with your people, um, with other leaders, and and with students, so to speak, to like empower and build them, build them up, and let them know what they can be. My last thing I would say, an attribute of a good leader is, good leaders are people are that vision dream. Oftentimes we're dealing with current state, but like, what can it be? <laughs> if there was no limits, what could it be? What would that feel like? What what would that look like? How would we be? And like. That's what we should be working towards, and how are we creating that today? If you would come into one of the CELT meetings or just in our area, you wouldn't know who is who by titles. You wouldn't. It looks like you're also creating the conditions, the perfect conditions for equity to manifest and to happen. And it makes me wonder about your approach, your ideas, your possible definitions of what equity is what it is not, um, and how black excellence fits within or without or around the idea of equity. What equity is to me is love. I think we have to be in love with humanity, valuing each other, seeing each other, loving the experience of uh, others, like loving the differences of others. Like to me, that's equity. And, like, you're getting exactly what you need in that moment, be it um, financial, be it emotional, be it um, academics, be it whatever it is. Like, to me, that's what's equity. I think to move to a more equitable society, we have to be intentional what's been historically taken from the historically excluded and make sure to get those things back, Right. Um, so we need to be intentional on how, who and how we're investing and not investing at them and investing with them. Thank you. I appreciate that. The, the, the other part of the question was um, the connections between equity, what you just de- uh, defined or helped me understand, and, and black excellence. Uh, these are really good questions. Um, I think black <coughs> excellence is black love. It's black joy. It's black experiences. It's, it's black knowledge. Um, there's oftentimes we try to create more than we see. Like when we see a kid smile, why are they smiling? Let's dive deeper into that, right? So if we're talking about black excellence around like our supporting our black students, but we don't talk to our black students about black excellence, it's off to me. They get to tell us what black excellence is. I can say what black excellence is for me, right. but until I connect to that student, like, like it's, it, it's done at them instead of done with them. From my experience and what I've seen and what I've been through is like, it's also what the equity part is, of it is understanding the perspective and removing the blinds because our student don't need to be as excellent at being black. They are. They already have black excellence since the day they were born. Since the day that they took in air, it's up to us to see it. So it's really about the work that we're doing, the equity journey, the equity adventure that we're doing. Adventure you're going along with multiple people, not just yourself. That's a journey the adventures that we're going on to value black excellence to see it because it's in front of us every single day. So the real question is, why can't we see it? Mm. And so that's a reflection on us. So that's when we had to hold up the mirror and it's like, what am I missing? Cause I, I, I don't think our black students or majority of our black students have horrible days for eight hours. <laughs> and if they do like, 
we got to do something about it. But, like, are you taking the moments and being intentional to see when this kid is having joy? And then how do we recreate that and, and, and do, more, do more of it? So I, I think the equity part is really us having honest conversations and that reflection work with ourselves to see, like, why aren't we seeing that? What's, what are our bias? What are our fragilities? What are our privileges that we can't understand, we can't see, or we can't feel black excellence and black joy? If, if there is one thing, one thing, that you would like to see changed in our current educational system within your lifetime. It doesn't have to be changed tomorrow, but something that could change, something that we could improve, get rid of, add, tweak. What would that thing be? I would redefine schooling. I, I would say redefine sc what schooling is. And it's even schooling the right word. Um, it's probably education, but... Like, I would like us to see, and I, I would like us to vision dream what things could be with no limits and then kind of backwards plan from that. Like, what is the emotions and experiences of what we want to see from our students? If they came out of DPS, like, how would they, what would their energy be? How would they vibrate? What would, like... What would that, like, I want to see that. And then let's backwards plan for that. Like, it's, it's these kids with amazing smiles that are inquisitive, that are change agents and all these, all these things. What are the conditions that we need to do to support that? That's what I would change. I, would, I guess I was unschooling is I would change the conditions of schools, mm -hmm. of schooling. I think kids come to school for connection, for relationships, to be valued, to be seen. And the academics is secondary. I'm not saying it's not important, mm -hmm. but when we're talking about humanity, like, I think it's important that we invest in people <laughs> and valuing people. So, like, what I hear you saying is, like, what – Similar to your staff, if like they're going to show up when they're respected, loved, and valued, right? Kids show up when they're respected, loved, and valued. And what if they every building in DPS? What if every student left respected, loved, and valued? Will we have to worry about attendance problems? Will we have to deal with as much behavior? Like we would be able to eliminate a lot of things that we have jobs and positions for like hopefully I would be out of a job because equity wouldn't be an issue because that's the norm it's, it's just like attendance uh -huh. is something that we just do <clears throat> and like I think like those are like that's 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 what I'm trying to do as the as a leader I think another attribute as a leader is is courage right the courage to vibrate and exist and do things in a way that it's not dependent on me. So like, I think I'm not, I'm trying to do my job in a way that my job doesn't need to exist. Cause that means equity is everywhere, everywhere. And it's in the air that we breathe now. So now it's just the, um, the norm and the courage to value students, the courage to value yourself, the courage to make make mistakes is is that getting to that way of like how we're existing differently in 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 edu education, because because it's like I believe if we value our students in in a way, it will eliminate so many different so many different problems in education. They say. I, there was an article saying like the main determiner of uh, success in school is a relationship with somebody in that school. Uh -huh. So how are we being more intentional with investing in relationships and supporting our teachers with how to build relationships? Go, once again, black excellence, um, different perspectives and things like that of like, let me help support educators with, with growing your perspective how do I simulate different experience so you can understand different cultures? Like, 
all these other things support with education um, in a way that I think can be redefining. Um, so we're not spending as much energy, quote unquote, on academics, but we're getting higher academic achievement. I, I feel very lucky to to have this podcast because every person I talk to is like educates me. Like it's like professional development for me every time I record an episode. So I really appreciate all of your contributions and your heart, man. Thank you. You have a really special heart. And I think your grandma has a lot, a lot to do with it. <laughs> Definitely. Um, but that's a work. I'm trying to see how can we continue to foster these conversations so we can come up with ideas and more collective wisdom around how to move forward without dividing each other that much, without fighting that much, uh, and, and more focusing on the kids. So it has been a pleasure to have this conversation with you. I, I really hope we can do this again sometime in the future with you, your team, maybe you and somebody else that you have in your team that want to elaborate onto something. I, I want this platform to be a springboard to these ideas and to love. So... Um, before we leave, I wonder if you have any final message to all the leaders, principals, everybody in DPS that's listening to us. Shout out Leslie Janelle, who's my supervisor. Like, uh, she, she's just dope. dope. Uh, <laughs> she, yes, she, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> she's. I had her here, Leslie. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, I, uh, I'll, sh I'll, sh I'll share with you her epi my yeah, episode. Yeah, she's. With her. Mm, I, yeah, she pushes me a lot, and she uh, she supports me with being a better version of myself. I, I, I think what I would say to leaders, you're everything and nothing at the same time. So, like, the current version of yourself needs to grow, so you need to let go. Like, almost thinking of it organically as a butterfly. Like, yeah. I, if you're a leader right now, I'm, I'm I could talk to myself, what if I'm just the egg? That means I need to transform into a caterpillar and move in a different way, push different things. And I eat and grow at that at that point. But then I need to go through another change, right? I need to go in a cocoon, reflect, grow, and then blossom into something beautiful, right? And I would say that to different leaders is like, what do you need to let go of? Are you still the same leader that you always have been? Are you willing to go through a metamorphosis? And what, like, what are you doing that's not working for you currently? And then, like, if you're changing and going through a metamorphosis, you're inviting your team and other people to change and go through a metamorphosis, which allows the educational system to change and go through a metamorphosis. I, I, in my experience, sometimes if if we want people to respond as respond to us different, we have to give them somebody different to respond to. Yeah. And so, be willing to be willing to change. That's what I would say to, to leaders. Thank you so much, man. What a pleasure. My pleasure. It's been actually a blessing. <laughs> thank you. So thank you so much. We'll. Uh, Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully we can do this again. Really yep. appreciate it. Okay.